Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Prague Report podcast interview. This is Roy. My guests on this episode are Joe Denizen and Jason Gianni from the band Joe Denizen Stratospherius. They have a new album on the way called Imposter, which comes out on October 11th. There's a bunch of songs out now that you can check out. I had a chance to speak with Jason and Joe about the new album and the band. Joe's time now as a member of Kansas and a whole lot more. But before we get started, just a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on all our socials, wherever you get your podcasts, parkerpark.com, and check out our new progressive art playlist on Spotify for music from Stratospheres and a whole lot more. And now my chat with Joe and Jason from Joe Denizen's Stratospheres. Uh, but good to have you guys on the uh, on the show. Jason, you and I have spoken a bunch in the past, and Joe yep. uh, got to know you recently a little bit. And, uh, I, you know, we're here to talk about the new Stratospherius album. Is it, it the name of the band is officially now Joe Denizen and Stratospherius. Uh, the, new album is Imposter. Uh, killer stuff, man. The new single, Outrage Olympics, is out now. If you guys haven't seen it, go check it out. It's really good. Album comes out on October 11th. Uh, good to have you guys. Uh, how are you guys doing? Doing Wonderful. well. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us, man. Really thanks for having us. Yeah, man. Happy, happy to do it. Um, so, Joe, I, I want to start with you a little bit because, uh, man, I don't you know, I know people have been aware of you for a while now, especially now, even more so since you're now in Kansas. Um, but you're always doing stuff, playing with a bunch of people. But I did a little bit of research going back into your career and it's even more than what I even knew at all. Like it's it's vast. You've done a lot and you've worked with everybody. Um, I'd like to get people a little bit more of a background on you, you know, your history sort of, I mean, in a shorter version, I suppose, but mm -hmm. you know, how, how'd you get started and, and then what led you to the status stratospherious bands? Uh, we'll get to the Kansas stuff later, but just sort of the early part. I'm curious how you got started. That's, that's, that's a loaded question. I'll try to do the shortest, <laughs> the shortest version possible. Um, I, I come from a family of classical musicians and, uh, we're immigrants. You know, we came from Russia when I was four years old and I uh, studied classical violin growing up, but then I, right around 13, 14, I got the rock and roll bug and, you know, picked up electric bass and, and, and guitar and was always into singing and writing songs. So at some point in high school, I discovered Jean-Luc Ponty and, and Mahavishnu and really, you know, vi I've been playing violin since I was six and I had a situation which uh, um, kind of was a watershed moment for me uh, and I discovered that I could you know, you could rock out on the violin. Um, and uh, I, I went to school for, for jazz violin. Um, and then I, I met a guy named Mark Wood who built these Flying V seven string crazy uh, electric violins. And I'm like, yeah, this is totally my my baby, you know? Um, uh, so that's the instrument I, I've been playing for the last three decades, the uh, Mark Wood seven string electric violins. Um, I played them in Stratospherius and in, and in Kansas. And I've, you know, I moved to New York to do my master's degree in, in uh, at Manhattan School of Music in 1997. No, yeah, seven. Oh my God, I'm old. Um, and just started freelancing in New York, playing in orchestras and Broadway shows and weddings. And I also put out a CD. That was my first CD, and it was more of an instrumental jazz fusion thing. And I was trying to find a band to play the music live, and I just wanted to play clubs and and, and tour and and have my original project going on while I was freelancing as a musician in New York. And, that, and it kind of eventually morphed into Stratospherius and it's undergone a lot of different eras and lineups. And yeah. uh, it's basically a creative outlet for me to explore uh, the, my favorite kind of, all my favorite music combined basically. And I think it, it, the sound has become much more well-defined and focused in the last 10 years, I would say. And I'm, I'm lucky to have Jason and, and Michelangelo, the guys, this current lineup is, is amazing. The best I've ever had. Yeah. yeah killer, killer band. Oh. Uh, Jason, thank you. How yeah. about you? What's your, what's your background a little bit? Also a loaded question. <laughs> um, I, uh, much like Joe, um, am classically trained, uh, classically trained percussionist, um, went through the whole schooling, uh, uh, in high school, grew up in New Jersey, went, w went through, you know, jazz band and concert band, all that kind of stuff. Went to university of Delaware for my undergrad, um, and I went to Penn State for my master's degree. Um, and uh, like Joe, always wanted to really kind of, uh, you know, be in the in the in the rock or pop or fusion or you know whatever world, um, rather than the classical world. I didn't want to 
trial for orchestras, it's too much on a percussionist carrying your equipment all over the place and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, then uh, moved out to California for 10 years. And then when I moved back uh, to New York City, I started teaching where I am now at the Collective School of Music. Been here for 17 years. And I met, um, uh, actually, I don't know. Oh, oh, uh, I met Angus Clark, who's the guitarist of the Trans Siberian Orchestra West. And uh, we formed a band together. And uh, from there, I ended up working with TSO for a couple of years. And that's how I met Mark Wood, who I've been with for over 10 years. I'm uh, a member of his band. And that's how I got introduced to Joe. And we've been playing together for about 10 years as well. Something like that. Yeah. Hard to believe. Well, that's been, pretty cool. So the Mark Wood connection fun. got you. Mark Wood connection. Wild. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We were, yep. we were both, te- Mark has an electric string camp in Kansas, ironically mm-hmm. enough, every year. And I've been teaching there since 2011. And Jason joined his band in 2015 or mm-hmm. 16. 2015. And, yep. and, and we had a lot of mutual friends. Um, my old guitarist played with Jason in the band. So mm-hmm. that's how we connected. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So, like, we, like I said, the, uh, the new album, Imposter, uh, comes out very soon. So I understand that some of the songs on here have been around a little bit, but then there's a bunch of new material also. So how did this album come together? How long has it been in the works? Uh, We worked very slow, Um, (laughs) partly, well, a lot of factors. We started tracking this, I think in late 2018 or or 2019, (laughs) I can't remember. Um, And then COVID hit. So we were working on the songs remotely, but mostly, which takes a long time. we released some singles. The first single, Imposter, was actually released in 2019. I'm, I'm ashamed to say it's been that long. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then we, re- we kind of dropped singles as we recorded them. And once we accumulated enough music for a new album, um, we waited for the right time to put it out. In the interim, we put out a double live record. So we were simultaneously editing that. And right. then I joined Kansas and my time got very full. So just, this took a long time to, to see the light of day, but I was determined to, to get it to the finish line because I, I, I think I believe we believe in the music and we can't wait for people to hear it, all of it. You know? Yeah. So Jason, is this so, the first since since that music started in, I guess, 22, 18? Is that when you joined? Did yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can't remember how how it all overlapped. But like Joe was saying, like I was in a band with uh, the old guitarist of Stratospherius. And um, as he was kind of leaving, Aurelian Booty Neck, by the yeah, way. Yeah, Aurelian, who's like, you know, one of the best guitar players and one of my, our, one of our best friends and everything, yes. you know, we're, you know. Um, and um, as he was kind of departing, I was kind of making my way in. I was kind of subbing at the time a little bit. I was sitting in on some gigs. And then um, because of my influence in my playing, Joe's like, I think I want to go more in that direction. And we started to start to take off from it. So yeah, this is my first record with, um, with them. But um arguably well, second uh, if you count the live one yeah 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 yeah, yeah, right. yeah of course yeah from uh prog stock but um i mean i think um i think there were there was kind of like an underlying reason why it took a while which was this music obviously as you know is a lot more um complex and it's taken a while to sort of and joe and i now are sort of a dare i say writing team in a way so it's taken us time to kind of like get our stuff together and make all that work rather than just sort of just spit out a bunch of songs we really took the time to really orchestrate the record the right way and put the right songs together and that sort of thing um and i I mean i'm i'm sure we'll get to it but it's you know the best record i've ever been a part of um you know i'm so incredibly happy with it but and i'm and i'm glad it took this time it, i kind of had to take this time to get to where it is you know absolutely and we wanted to get you know i wanted to have the best musicians and the best mixing engineer that that i knew and I, we were both big fans of the work of rich mauser i'm a huge spock beard fan and uh all the stuff the that rich has mixed and Rich is expensive and he works very slow because he's he was trying to fit us in between, you know, you know, Spock's Beard, Dream Theater, uh, Pattern Seeking Animals and all, all the he was mixing my record collection and fixed right. fitting me in in between, you know, <laughs> basically because uh, everything he was telling me he was working on I'm like, oh, my God, I can't wait to hear it. You know, the new transatlantic. <laughs> but anyway, he, he just it, it exceeded my wildest dreams, you know, yeah. what he did. And the, he just gets it, you know, intuitively. The, I, usually I send back a mix multiple times because I'm a pain in the ass, but Rich just got what we were going for and it, it exceeded our wildest expectations. I think Jason would agree. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah and I, yeah. I was working with but, Neil Morris at the time. And uh, so I, I got to know Rich very well. And I said to Joe, 
man, you know, I'm working with him. We should we should really get him to at least do one song. Yeah, I think that's how, how it started, if I'm not mistaken. He, he, did, he did the first did, one, Imposter. Yeah, Imposter. And we were like, oh, my God. We're blown away. We yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we're it just it took a long time because Rich is very busy, too. So it was a combination of things that, that made it a slow process, sure. but worth every all the, the time spent I everything think, yep. you know, all yeah everything. absolutely yeah talk about the other guys in the band i mean uh i you have bill hubauer from uh, also neil morse band uh in, yeah. in on this one final he, and he's amazing super talented guy as well plays every instrument ever um, talk about guy. the rest of the guys on the album so uh Paranieri plays bass and he's he's been working with me for many years i think since before jason joined uh michelangelo Quirinali on guitar who uh, also has been working with me. He started subbing in the band, and as Aurelian got busier, Michelangelo became a full-time guitar player um, and talked about Jason. And then um, Bill, I met through Jason, because we went to see Neil Morse, and I, you know, I really fell in love with his work on those albums and uh, asked if he'd like to contribute. Actually, I originally had asked Tom Brislin to play on Imposter, and at the time, he was deep in the weeds writing the, the Kansas record. You know, uh, so that then I called Bill and he ended up playing on most of the record and just did an amazing job. You know, Bill is such um, a Swiss Army knife. You know, just like amazing. can do everything yeah. amazingly yeah. well. He uh, plays like really... twenty different instruments and yeah. And, and every time he would send us tracks, he would send us like thirty different tracks with <laughs> so many options and they were all amazing. So I was like, how am I going to choose what to use? <laughs> you know it's awesome yeah so, that's great he was very generous uh, with yeah anyway yeah well on top of the the killer band i mean you got a bunch of guests on the record too you talk yeah. about who you have uh joining you guys it's amazing we, we've ne i've never had this many guests on a record and i think you know working with dave kersner inspired me because he's the kind of guy that, that has like a million cameos you know but i got to yeah. know people in, in the Prague community over the years doing festivals playing you know going to a lot of concerts and it's just asking people if they'd like to participate. I'll uh, list some of the people we have. Fernando Perdomo on guitar plays on the song. Michael Sadler from Saga is a guest vocalist on the song Storm Surge. Rachel Flowers plays uh, piano and flute on Storm Surge. Uh, we have Chloe Lowry from Trans-Siberian Orchestra, who I uh, met through Jason. Um, Angus Clark, who we talked about, plays uh, a brief make us a brief appearance in uh, the song Outrage Olympics. Randy McStein, uh, guest vocals and uh, some guitar sound effects throughout the album. Old friend of ours um, and a lot of other people. I mean, it's a long list and it's all credited on the album, but it's pretty yeah. amazing the, the, the amount of people that contributed to this project in, in such yeah. a beautiful way. So I'm very grateful. It, to it, it really yeah. does sound good. Um, so um, the single Outrage Olympics has been out uh, now a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, really cool song, funny video, very cool, cool performance stuff. Uh, talk about that track. That's one of the newer ones, right? And so, yes. How, or how long has that one been in the works? <laughs> like a year. We'll, we'll spend a year on a song. It's it's kind of it's kind of pathetic. So how does it go from from writing to to being done for you? I mean, how does the process start for a song like that? Well, I I I demo the song, you know, in my home studio, um, and then I'll send it to the guys. And um, Jason always comes up with some extra sections that I didn't think about that just enhance <laughs> the song, and it it turned into like the bookends of that particular song, um, and uh, then we. Gradually to start to, I, then we create a foundation track and we start to layer on it and we, you know, send each other the tracks over the course of many weeks or months. Um, and then it's just, it, it ends up growing into this massive thing with a uh, hundred tracks and it's a matter of choosing what's going to make the final cut, editing things together and sending it to Rich. So it's, it's a process, you know, yeah. and in between that we're busy, we're, we're all parents and we're all gigging musicians and you know, a lot of other life things get in the way, you know, so. Jason, what, what's, uh, what's uh, it like for you working on a song like that and then going through the process of, of the, the writing and, and recording of this thing? Yeah. Uh, you know, Joe, Joe said it perfectly is that I, I have a, I have a tendency to, um, hear, I either bring something that I've written before into it, or I hear something that Joe maybe didn't think of. I, I, I think I, I've been um, instrumental in a lot of like the slower, prettier, orchestrated kind of parts. I don't know if I'm like a, a sad person in general or something, <laughs> or which yeah. I'm actually not. I'm really happy, uh, but I write that way. Um, actually, the um, the bookends of the song, the intro piano. Actually, I wrote the orchestrated the end first, 
and then we put it on piano. But it was from a song that I wrote 10 years ago. I don't even know if Joe knows this. No, um, no. And it was from a song I wrote 10 years ago with a band that I was signed with in California called Migs. Um, and it was, um, it was a little too progressive for them. They were more of a pop rock band. But it was a song that was about... Um, uh, not to get too deep, but uh, all the all the the stuff in the news that was going on, where these women were disappearing and uh, their, their murders and that sort of thing, and 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 if if there was a heaven, what the people in heaven would say to them about what happened, and uh, it was this really deep song, and and this whole da 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 da, you know, this whole like orchestra. Oh, I'm singing the wrong part. That's um, that's uh, oh, I'm singing the wrong song. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that was storm surge. <laughs> That's right. But but which this, is another example of something. Which is another example. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 oh. this song it was the same way. It was it was something that I wrote uh, years ago and uh, and I brought it in and and I was like wow this actually works with this song, and Joe's been you know Joe's usually very receptive to this stuff. Joe Joe's thing is let me sleep on it. And then usually wakes up the next morning and goes, I love it. And I'm like, no, oh, okay, my, cool. <laughs> no, my first reaction is grumble, grumble, grumble. This isn't going to yeah. work. Let me sleep on it. And then I come yeah. around like, yeah, this is cool. Right. You know? It's cool. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, but yeah, so but going back to outrage, the, the topic of the song was actually kind of raging against cancel culture. Yeah. And yeah. the idea is we're all under surveillance. Well, the video kind of brings that concept across. We're all under surveillance, both from the government and we're surveilling each other. And we're kind of rat ratting on each other all the time and a lot of the time facts, facts. your your whole <laughs> life can be ruined because someone maybe misconstrues something you say sure. you could lose your career and we're in this weird dystopian present dystopian reality where you know you, you got to walk on eggshells with everything you say and do and it's kind of a social commentary on that and it's not specific to one or the other side of the political spectrum and i think everyone can kind of uh agree to an extent with the message of the song I think. I hope. Yeah, I, I think so. It's right on. Um, there's also a really cool cover of Frame by Frame on there. Uh, that's, I guess that's one of the yeah. previously released things, but works really well, uh, you know, with how you guys play it. It's one of the better versions of that song I've heard. Um, th you know, why'd you decide to do that one? I just always liked the, I, that song always spoke to me. And Adrian Ballou's voice is in my range, so I'm very comfortable singing the songs. And I also thought it would be cool to cover it because I could, the Robert Fripp ostinato guitar part works really well on the violin. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's ever tried that. So we, we've just been playing it live and we thought, let's record our version of it because I think it, it would be an interesting thing to have. And we used a female a singer to, to do the background vocals, the answer vocals, our friend Val Vagoda, uh, who's also a great songwriter and violinist in her own right. Um, so, and it's also timely because Beat is on tour. Uh, it's kind of coincidence that, that we're re-releasing that song. They just played here and I didn't get a chance to go. So I was kind of bummed about that. Uh, Sorry, I missed that I, one. I got my tickets for Red Bank October 9th. So I'm looking forward to that. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jason, last time I saw you play down here, I think it was for the, yeah. the Queen show. Yep. From, with, with Mark uh, Martell. Yep. Mark Martell, which was amazing. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, that, was so, he's, that was so good. Uh, but what else have you been involved in recently outside of uh, this this group? Um, so a couple things. I, I play Broadway. Um, so I, I am uh, off and on. Uh, I'm not a chair player. I actually prefer to be a sub so that I can be do different shows and have a flexible schedule. Um, and uh, I play in um, some corporate uh, projects right now. Um, one of them is the Rock of Ages Band. Um, which is the original band from the Rock of Ages show on Broadway. We get to fl get flown out to different, um, uh, different, you know, areas and venues and that sort of thing. Uh, I play with a band called Rubik's Cube, uh, which is like the '80s band uh, of of the East Coast, which is amazing. Real quick about the Broadway stuff. So, yeah, uh, as a as sort of a sub guy on that, when you show up to do one of those shows, do they just hand you sheet music and you? you play or is there a period of rehearsal for something like that? So, uh, yeah, um, you know, Broadway is, is a kind of misconstrued a lot to musicians where a lot of people think there's like an audition process and, and, uh, and then you, you get to learn the, the show at your leisure and that's not really the way it works. So most chair players are kind of in on the ground floor. They know the music director, they're brought in maybe as even production parts of the show, design the show, this, that, and the other thing. And then from a sub standpoint, 
Um, if you know the people well, it's a very social type of uh, environment. And if you know them and they trust you as a player, they say, hey, hey, you know, I need a sub. I can use a sub. Come on in. Um, and then what happens is, especially now with the Internet and uh, technology, you're sent um, anything from the book to audio to conductor video. Um, and you have to do all your work at home. So everything's done on your setup. You do all the work, you follow it, and then they say, you know, are you, are you ready? You know, two, three weeks later, are you ready for a show? Yeah, you come in and you just play. And it's a sink or swim kind of thing. You can either oh, um, bomb out or you can do well, great and be asked back. I, I, I've right. subbed on shows and you, you, you get one shot. You get one and, shot. <laughs> and you got to be perfect. It's like the most seamless thing. You got to be perfect. And if there's one little thing, you're gone. It's a really cutthroat yeah. kind of I bet it's tough. Situated everybody, scene, I mean, you know. there's so few jobs there, and everybody wants yeah. these gigs, right? I mean, that's got to yep. be, and it's the best of the best. Uh, well, I I have to talk to you, Joe, about Kansas. Uh, very cool. That uh, I mean, knowing how you play, knowing your background, and and even if if people didn't know you were in Kansas and they heard this album, they they would think, wow, this guy'd be perfect for Kansas. It just sounds oh. right, right Thanks. in line. So, uh, you know, how'd you get the call for that? Talk about. The, you know, the joining the group and, and that whole process. It, it was funny because, um, well, it was a random night, um, February of uh, 2023. And I had uh, slight cut my finger slicing a salad. And I was in the ER getting stitches on my finger. And I got a text from Tom Brislin of all, you know, it was the weirdest thing, man. And I'm like writhing in pain. And I'm like, what could this be? Because we me and Tom weren't like close friends. We were acquaintances. Like, you know, I'm curious. Okay, I'm going to call him on the way home. So I call him up and he said, you know, we've all had uh, COVID. We had to cancel 20 shows. So the new rule in the band is everyone has to have a, a backup guy. And everyone does except uh, Dave Ragsdale, the violinist. Would you like to check out the music? And I said, absolutely. He goes, all right, cool. So send Phil Ehart, the drummer, a video or two. Or two. So I send him Imposter. Um, which probably is our most Kansas y Stratospheria song because it has keyboards in it. It sounds a little bit like Kansas. Yeah. And I think, ironically enough, like because of my work with Stratospheria, helped me get the Kansas job. You know? yeah. And uh, the next day, Phil called me. We had a, a long conversation and he practically offered me the gig. And we hit it off right away and it was great. Um, and it was on and off. I had to learn the music, transcribe it because there was nothing written. He sent me 25 songs to learn. It was a 50th anniversary set list, which was originally two and a half hours long. They cut some stuff since then. Um, but I was working my, my butt off for three months, learning and memorizing the music. But there, it was uncertain what would happen um, because there was a situation with David. They weren't sure if he could, could or could not do the tour. So it was just be ready, know everything, but you might not get to play it at all. Um, it was a weird mental game, you know, and finally in May, I got the call that they needed me to, to step in and do the tour and that I ended up becoming a full-time member of the band. Um, so quite an emotional roller coaster, and it's been a dream come true, just an unbelievable experience. And I, I wake up every day and just count my blessings, you know, the yeah. crew, the band, the music, just, I couldn't just ask the for the best guys. Band. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how it happened. It was a culmination of years of just, you know, writing music that I love and putting music out there and just meeting other musicians and kind of being in the community and um, just putting in the work, never with the goal of specifically joining Kansas, just kind of doing what I love and hanging out with people, with like-minded people. And the universe works in those ways sometimes, you know, which is... Yeah, kind of, and, and the band right know. now is just sounds awesome. I mean, I saw the show last year and it's just incredible. It's Thank really, you. really great. Um, so how is Phil doing? Is, has he been back playing yet or he's still not playing? No. He, well, his doctor gave him the all clear and then he had another medical issue that surprisingly happened, which he was going to come and play in Topeka next week. We're, we're going to be doing a residency there and uh, Dave Hope and Kerry Livren are going to sit in with us, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> but Phil cannot be there. He's probably going to come back later in the tour and play a little bit. Uh, Great. But I don't, I don't know if he's going to uh, stay in the band or retire. Um, he's been the manager of Kansas for 40 years and is very comfortable in that role. He thinks he'd be better served behind the scenes. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But I love playing with Phil and I'm going to, you know, I cherish every moment that, that 
he's still going to be playing with us. We'll see what happens. You know? Well, in the band recently, uh, Billy Greer also just retired uh, a few weeks right. ago. And, yeah. Uh, you have a new new bassist, um, Dan, what's the last name? Dan, Dan McGowan. McGowan, that's right. Uh, from T, T Club. Some of your, your uh, listeners might be familiar with his band. Yeah. Yeah, I know about the yeah. He's 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 talented as well. Well, I mean, good luck to to that band. Keep it on going, man. It's some of the best music ever, and and uh, I think in in any form, you guys are just kicking ass, and and it's great and, to have out there. You and, know? and I think you know, there's there's people that say it's not Kansas anymore and all that, but the truth is, you know, a lot of that generation of musicians in the next five or ten years are not going to be performing anymore, and people have a choice. You could either stay home. Or you can go hear the music played live by people who care about it deeply, you know, and that's, it's, I think yeah, rock and roll is going I, I through a reckoning I, right now. You know? I've come, I've come over yeah. to that side at the, you know, over many years of, of getting to see all these different versions of bands play and realizing I'd rather hear this music than not hear it. That's it. That, you know, you know, at the end of the day. Um, I mean, look I mean, at jazz. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's also, you know, in speaking to Phil, you know, it's 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 musicians that are vetted by the band. It's not just like, right. you know, just people off the street. You know, the the, the organization vets them, and yeah. they're getting the best people to do it. And Phil mentioned something really interesting: is like he he views it as almost like a classical composer. I mean, people are still playing Mozart, people are still playing right. Beethoven. Yeah. You know, and and you know that's the way I look at it. And to me, the bands never sound better as well. Yeah. I, I, I made a uh, post saying, you know, my wife's in the New York Philharmonic. She's a violinist. They were founded in 1842. There are no original members <laughs> left. <laughs> there aren't? <laughs> Believe it or not. Yeah. But pe people still, you know, pack the concert hall. So that's, I think, I hope that rock and roll lives that long and, and people are going to be still packing concert halls 100 years from now, you know? I, um, think, I think that's just how it has to, has to work. And I think it's yeah. worth it. You know, I think if it's done right, professionally approved like how you guys do it um it's all good you know and ronnie's a, i mean just the best singer you know you got, amazing. You got it all there it's amazing it's all, yeah. he's awesome yeah. um yeah. i wanted to also ask you because i saw something in your bio about the school of rock that that you were involved in back uh in arizona My, is that something you still do or uh, are involved with this is interesting so in 19 when i first moved to new york in 1998 i got a call from this guy robert bonfilio who's a classical harmonica player. He plays chromatic harmonica with orchestras, concertos. That's how he makes his living. But he, he and his wife founded uh, the Grand Canyon Music Festival in 1983. And he also plays blues and a little bit of jazz. And he was on RCA Records, kind of easy listening, new age kind of stuff. So he was looking for a new violinist in his band. I auditioned for him, got the gig. And since 1998, I've been coming to the Grand Canyon Music Festival every September, almost every year, you know. And in 07, uh, the guitarist in the band at the time and myself, we co-founded Grand Canyon School of Rock, which is one week program where we get local school kids together. We form a band, we teach them to play, we do a concert. And that was uh, funded by the local commission for the arts and we had sponsors and everything. And it's still going on. And I haven't done the gig in two years because I was touring with Kansas. So now it's going on without me. But that's a very beautiful experience because the kids are amazing. And sometimes, yeah. you know, they could barely there's no music teachers up in the Grand Canyon Village. It's a very far from places you could take lessons. And, you know, they get the experience of learning to play sometimes from the from scratch, like they've had almost no experience playing. So and some of them are really talented and, and can play really well. So that's very cool. Well, this is fun, guys. Uh, congrats. The new album Imposter comes out October 11th. There's a, a track out now. There's a few tracks out now that I guess you can find online. And uh, definitely check out the album, pick it up, um, check out Kansas if they're coming to your town. Where can people see you next, Jason? Uh, well, we're, we're slowly getting back into booking shows because we've been so, um, you know, it, it, we've been really detailed as far as finishing this video and releasing the record and this, that, and the other thing. So the next show is dis, uh, December 15th. But, uh, well, we haven't announced it yet. I oh. guess we're announcing it now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, Cats out of the bag. So yeah, yeah. go ahead, Jason. I'll, no, I'll you, you, you you say it. You, you, you uh, booked it. So well, we're working it. on uh, doing a December fifteenth show at the Williams Center in Rutherford, uh, and it's also going to be around the time of my fiftieth birthday. So it might end up being like a show slash birthday party. Awesome. Um, and, be fun. and it's and it's gonna it's gonna be our CD release. I guess two months after the fact, and we're gonna have Randy McStein and Dave Bainbridge opening and sitting in. 
and maybe some other surprise artists we'll see well that's cool yeah. we should be get that word out that's amazing yeah. uh so keep an eye out for that online i'm sure you'll hear about it we'll 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 spread the news on it on our channel, sure, I'm sure. I was going to say, we don't play that often, so every show is a big event, so people should come to see the band, so we're up to <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. that's right. Sorry, yeah. Uh, all right, guys, we'll have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for having us, man. Thanks for having okay. us, Roy. Yeah. All right. Take okay. care. See you soon. Right. Cool. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for checking out the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on all our socials and progreport.com. And we'll see you all again real soon. Thanks.